Hello and welcome to episode 98 of the Market Maker podcast. And to give you an idea of what we're going to cover this week, it has, of course, been the big US investment banks reporting their corporate earnings. Some good, some bad, some incredibly ugly. So we'll, we will um, we'll dive into those numbers and hopefully explain a little bit about the kind of composition of the banking space and why banks like GS and MS are slightly different to likes of JPM or Citi, and then where the asset managers and boutiques fit into this mix. So we'll look to explain. And then also we're going to talk about the debt ceiling, um, something that I know Piers and I have lived through in previous episodes of, of volatility. So we'll talk a little bit about that back in 2011, but we'll talk about it in the context of right now, because the US government could default. <laughs> and if that did happen, that's kind of a big deal. So we'll um, we'll discuss what the probability of that is and what the process is and so on. But before I begin, two things just to mention. One, just as we've hit the record button for this, some news has just dropped down the tape. Alphabet or Google, they're planning to cut roughly 12,000 jobs globally, equates to around 6% of the workforce. So I was just kind of tallying it up with the likes of Microsoft, I think it was 10,000. And then Amazon was 18,000. Salesforce was 8,000. Twitter, seven and a half. It's racking up, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, Silicon Valley, I mean, the uh, unemployment rate has, uh, has, has spiked. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's obviously a natural function of the ebbs and flows of the economic cycle. Um, so, you know, continued job cuts at these big tech firms is definitely the direction of travel. It's not surprising, this information. Um, but yeah, I, I guess, you know, there's become a little bit um, sort of over bloated, um, you know, over the last decade. And yeah, you're getting a lot, I, I think a lot of incredibly well paid sort of middle management staff that you know what do they do um are they needed i mean like musk is i guess musk has set the cat amongst the pigeons hasn't he mm. strolling into twitter and basically saying look this company could function on one quarter of the staff <laughs> and he's gone ahead and done it <laughs> and i don't know obviously time will tell whether whether he's right or not um, but yeah, I think it's certainly the case that these these big tech firms are very bloated, and um, yeah, they need to cut some fat. Yeah, and 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 sticking with the tech theme before we get into the the banking earnings, I don't know if you saw that Sky News report that was circulating this week. It was titled "Recruitment Team Unwittingly Recommended a Chat GPT Candidate for a Job Interview." <laughs> so someone had submitted. Basically, so you know when you do these application processes, often it involves something like write me a 500 word statement about a topic that you're interested in. Right. Yeah. So basically, they <laughs> set it up and they acted as a candidate, but used Chat GPT, and only 20 percent of the candidates at this communications company got um, made it through fast tracked. Yeah, through to interviews and <laughs> top of the class, of course, <laughs> was your buddy Chat. GPT. So Excellent. <laughs> Love but I, I, I was making a point of this in a post I did a few days ago, because um, already I've incorporated it into my working practice, because yeah. quite often for a, an information gathering exercise to uh, spark content ideas for content writing, for a large degree, blog writing, it's all very much well equipped to uh, to field those types of things but one of the things is the allure that I can imagine that a lot of finance students are feeling <laughs> when it comes to that arduous process of banking applications and it's yes. like write me 300 words about why I should work at Goldman Sachs okay yeah. write me 300 words <laughs> why I should work at Goldman Sachs bum, 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 bum. So I, I guess the, the post I did was just a word of warning in that, I mean, look, the results it punches out are impressive. I mean, it sounds great what it writes, and it may well save you time and see you through the process quicker. But ultimately, it's a pretty yeah. 
rigorous testing process you go through for one amplified simulations are pretty much embedded in every assessment center for top financial institutions where you will you have to participate and your behavior will be monitored and tracked about your ability to function in a specific role so unfortunately the um the ai is not going to come to your your savior in that circumstance so i guess just a word of warning um yeah. be prepared <laughs> yeah you'll get you'll get found out in the end um... <laughs> Or I won't. I'll peel my face off. And actually, <laughs> I'm a I'm a Tesla bot with open AI technology. <laughs> Who knows? But yeah, let's let's delve into these these banking earnings then. And yeah. as I said earlier, I think one of the most um, kind of divergence that we saw was because they reported on the same day at the same time, and that was Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. Who are often kind of put in the same conversation often given their their businesses and how they operate but <clears throat> goldman's fell almost eight percent and they've had a pretty bumpy ride recently for a number of different reasons consumer banking to restructuring to banking fees and, ev and everything in between but morgan stanley have been operating within that same environment and yet their shares were up almost six percent so yeah. what happened? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, big, yeah, big kind of divergence. I guess it's, um, I guess it's to answer that question, we need to talk about what, because the, they're massive institutions, these banks, and it's got pretty complex. And there's now multiple kind of divisions and, and elements of, of the bank. And it's, um, I think we need to kind of step back and look at the structure of these big banks in order to be able to answer that question as to why is the performance between Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs so so different when, you know, historically, they're like the same kind of business, right? They're absolute direct rivals. And so, and I think maybe we could step back even further just briefly and talk about banks. I mean, there's investment banks and then there's commercial banks. Um, or you could even say retail banks as well, right? Um, and I think from a sort of, let's call them consumer banks, you know, that's the traditional format of, you know, a bank that essentially takes deposits from consumers. And for that, the bank will pay that consumer uh, an interest on their deposit. Of course, since the financial crisis, we've had interest rates at zero. So, you know, if you've, if you've opened your first bank account uh, within the last, well, let me think, within the last 13 years, um, then you'll be thinking, what in interest on my deposit account? What are you talking about? Um, but obviously, interest rates have just gone up sharply in 2022. So you might now see this weird kind of um, income coming into your deposit account each month. It's like, well, hang on. Right, I'm actually earning some money by uh, depositing my cash at a bank. Um, so that's what happens. The bank pays you, right? They pay you a deposit rate. But then, of course, the bank's business model on the, on the retail and commercial banking side, the bank's business model is they then take those deposits and they lend them. They lend that money, okay? I think mortgages, for example. So they're kind of borrowing on the short term and essentially paying a really low interest rate to borrow from the consumer and then they're lending on the longer term mortgages let's say and they're charging a much higher interest rate for the loans okay and this is how historically these kind of big consumer banks um, make money they call that the net interest income right it's the net income from that paying the deposit rate to your depositors versus earning the lending rate from your loans out into the system. And when interest rates rise, this is beautiful. This is a perfect moment for these banks because then the difference between short-term rates and long-term rates increases. And so essentially the net interest income gap widens. So historically in an interest rate hiking cycle, 
this is good news for these banks. Okay, so that's like the commercial or the consumer bank side. Then you got investment banks, which is nothing to do with deposits. This is now think Goldman's and Morgan Stanley, and that and and even those banks are split into kind of two big divisions, right? So when you think Goldman's, you tend to think right M and A. You know, it's, it's all about the investment banking division, the IBD side. And so there they're generating fees for the services that they're providing in helping their clients raise capital uh, or they're helping their clients grow through mergers or, or acquisitions. OK, then the other side of the bank is more on the market side. And so that's your sales and trading activities, the trading floor of these banks and and there. They're earning money through fees, again, for services that they're providing. But the service they provide is to their financial institution clients, where they're helping hedge funds and asset managers trade. OK, they're helping facilitate their trades. They're also providing some, you know, the bro prime brokerage divisions, for example, are providing some advisory services to hedge funds and so on. OK, now, typically with the investment banks, those two sides the thing is about these fee generating parts, certainly on the IBD side, they're very cyclical because, right, how much money can you make as an investment banking division is obviously a function of, well, how many companies are looking to raise capital? How many companies are looking to make acquisitions? And obviously, that goes up and down with the economic cycle. So in 2022, it was a shocker of a year because we had a downturn in the cycle. Uh, everything was very depressed. Risk appetite was incredibly low. So com companies weren't looking to acquire other companies. Companies weren't looking to do like IPOs and raise capital. And so this meant that the IBD side of the banks had a really bad year. OK, we'll talk about the figures in a minute. But... The way they've set up is they've got an equal and opposite side of their bank. So the trading side, the sales and trading divisions, they actually make more money when market volatility increases. So what happened in 2022 was whilst the IBD division's income dropped and dropped and dropped, actually the market side saw their revenues go up because market volatility stepped higher which is typically what happens in a downturn yeah so yeah and with the well, one of the <laughs> things i remember Stephen saying in a, in a previous podcast was about how a company like goldman's is valued given that it sees this variance as you say comparative to someone like morgan stanley who might have a much larger wealth and right. asset management business or take that even a step further, like JP Morgan, who's then starting to be involved in some of these commercial activities as well. So these wealth management divisions, yeah, I should add that in. I mean, they, they are certainly now becoming bigger. I, I'd say over the last decade have become an ever bigger portion of these, these banks like Goldman's, like Morgan Stanley, Citigroup, JP Morgan, you know, they've almost kind of taken up, it's almost like a buy side uh, sort of entity in terms of their asset and Welsh man wealth management um, divisions. Um, but, you know, the thing about, I guess the thing about Goldman's, and look, you do have to go back to the financial crisis very quickly to just explain why Goldman's are doing what they're doing now. And actually then we'll talk about the fact they're doing it really badly. Um, go back to the financial crisis. Goldman's and Morgan Stanley, were, they were like the old kind of broker-dealer format. They were the old sort of straight-up investment bank, no deposits at all. It was just M&A advisory, and then it was on trading on the market side, okay? But what happened in the crisis was all these big broker-dealers were over-leveraged and were getting killed by the big market collapse. And, of course, the poster child of that crisis was Lehman Brothers that went bankrupt. They were a big broker dealer, took too much risk, markets collapsed, and they went out of business. Prior to Lehman's collapsing, there was Bear Stearns and Merrill Lynch, who were also going down that same pipe, okay? But they got bailed out by essentially being bought. Mm. Um, so Bear Stearns was bought by JP Morgan. Uh, I say bought. 
they I think they famously paid one dollar. Yeah, um, something like that. Yeah. And then Bank of America bought Merrill Lynch, and essentially the U.S. government pretty much forced them to buy Merrill Lynch, because if they don't, they'll go bankrupt, and it will create this systemic risk. And and then Lehman's were the third one in line. And anyway, Barclays were going to buy them, and they mm. got vetoed. Anyway, Lehman's went bankrupt, right? So then next, so it was Bear Stearns first. They were the most exposed. They got bought by JP Morgan. Merrill Lynch were the second most exposed. They got bought by Bank of America. Lehman's were third most exposed. They went bankrupt. Morgan Stanley were the fourth and Goldman's were the fifth. And so now it's like, oh, right, Morgan Stanley, right, you're now, basically they were on the slope with Lehman's and they were going to go bankrupt and Goldman's as well. Mm. It was all imploding. And the U.S. government did a deal. And what they did was they said to Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, look, you need to take on a commercial banking license. If you do that, you will then be able to access our Federal Reserve overnight emergency lending window, which will essentially give you the liquidity you need to not go bankrupt. But taking on a commercial banking license, the reason why they hadn't done that in the past was because that then opens you up to much more regulatory oversight. Mm. And they were forced to do it. They had no choice. Fine. They took on a commercial banking license. Okay, That's how it all started. I mean, fast forward a decade plus now, and you could argue taking on a commercial license and being a commercial bank is a good thing for diversification. It's certainly like when you look at 2022 as a year where M&A activity collapsed, you're like, ah, thank God for the diversification of a commercial banking side, right? So that's kind of where it all started. But Goldman's have, you know, really quite aggressively been going after this diverse um, commercial banking operation. And the big reason why Goldman's results were so bad um, was because of their botched attempt mm. at trying to grow their commercial banking size, uh, side of the business. And actually, David Solomon, uh, the Goldman CEO, um, on the earnings call, because when, when companies have their earnings reports, right, yes, they release this report with all the facts and the figures, but they also then have typically have a call, like literally a, uh, an online call with investors, and with their shareholders and kind of talk, walk them through the report and talk about it. And then there's a QA and a session. Um, and one of the investors asked David Sonman, what went wrong? I mean, what, why is this so bad? And David Solomon's response, he basically said that the firm, he admitted the firm had tried to do too much too fast in terms of their commercial banking expansion. And he said that they had lacked the talent to pull off some of the wide, some of their wide ranging ambitions. Mm. And like a couple of points to add to that, firstly, on the mishap with the commercial side. So to put some figures on that, they republished new earnings figures for the last three years. And so showing that that particular unit, the consumer banking side, had made a loss of three billion US dollars since 2020. So to put that into some perspective, the other thing you mentioned there was about talent. Yeah. And Goldman's have just recently cut roughly 6% of its global workforce. However, in Q4, Goldman spending on compensation and benefits was up 16%. <laughs> yeah. You see that? This is the classic problem with these firms. Like when they have these cyclical mm. revenue, look, their, their, their IBD divisions, their, 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 their revenues were down 50%, right? 50% um, down, but compensation went up because here's the problem, right? If you don't pay them, I mean, they, these bankers have got, they're, they're in this situation where, look, if you don't pay me, it's almost it's almost like performance is now completely disconnected to actual remuneration. If you don't pay me, then I'm off. I'll right. go somewhere particularly else. Thanks. When your reference point has been 21 and 2020, when you've got yeah. a massive bonus. Right. <laughs> so if you don't pay me, I'm off. Thanks. Um, there's other people who, who will employ me. 
Um, and mm. actually, yeah, more news this morning. Perhaps we'll mm. talk about it in a bit more detail in a minute. But UBS have just kind of stepped up and going, right, we're hiring. We're aggressively hiring. All you lot that have just been really pissed off with your rubbish, your rubbish bonuses, doors open. Come on, come on over. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, on that on that point, what's interesting is there's two sides of that. So one, you're absolutely right. The headline kind of reads disgruntled. Yeah. So <laughs> UBS are basically headhunting disgruntled deal makers, and they're disgruntled because of the lack of this ginormous bonus that they've become somewhat accustomed to but the interesting thing there as well was about uh, the shift of talent that's been coming out that apparently from the last decade out of bulge bracket banks into boutiques yeah where actually investment banks find it incredibly hard to retain staff um even at that level so yeah very interesting um, and yeah paying 16 percent increase on a year <laughs> And these boutiques, I mean, I, I often think the word boutique, I mean, that when you think about boutique, you think you think about something really small. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and these boutiques are not small now. As you say, over the last decade, I mean, here are some names. Um, like the big, the big boutiques are um, uh, Julian Loki. Um, there's one called PJT Partners. There's Evercore, Lazard, Green Hill, um, Roby Warshaw, these are the kind of bigger boutiques. And yeah, they've been running this sort of strategy of essentially allowing the big banks to hire and train new graduates, spend a couple of years um, at Goldman's, mm. get Goldman's to essentially pay for their training. Then you hire them after they've been there for two, three years or so, bring them across to, let's say, Evercore. And then you've got, yeah, a ready made you know, analyst with experience. Um, so that's what's been happening. Actually, Will Will's over in New York at the moment. And actually yesterday, I know, sorry, Tuesday and Wednesday, we were working with Evercore. We run an M&A simulation for Evercore. And then Will was having a meeting with Julian Loki yesterday. So we're, we're kind of, our simulations are, you know, starting to, you know, creep into that uh, boutique M&A. Well, yeah, boutique. It's not quite the right word, but these these kind of, these more kind of standalone M and A houses, where it's just less complicated. They're just straight up. They're just M and A. You know, yeah. forget about all of this other bolt-on diversification stuff. They're just kind of keeping that kind of thing simple. Yeah. So you almost think that you know, in a non-finance way, if you were thinking about any job sector, a company built for purpose with one goal, yeah, would surely create the best pool of talent you would have thought um interesting with numbers i mean evercore was only founded or m a transactions they've only been doing them since 1995 what do right. you reckon is the size total size of dollar value of the deals that they've done well evercore yeah since 1995 yeah wow T total value of deals done yeah total value of the m a transactions that's a good question. All right, let me think. I'm going to go. Um, uh, I'm going to say eight hundred billion. That's not even close. <laughs> Is it like multiple trillions? Four point seven trillion. Yeah, I mean that. I, mean, I thought they so might just, start off small. Yeah, all right. Again, right. and then in terms of staff. I mean, how many staff are we talking about? I think the no idea. I think the technology department of JP Morgan is forty-five thousand employees. Yeah, to give you some context. Technology <laughs> department. That's not their biggest department. <laughs> Evercore have under two thousand staff. Is that right? Wow. Yeah. yeah. So that yeah. I mean, if you think about it, then you would have to say that this is like the SAS of the M and A world. Right. Yeah, they're they're the absolute. Yeah, specialists. Let's not get distracted by yeah multiple divisions and diversification. And look, I like and as David Solomon has said, I mean, growing your your kind of business by diversifying is very hard. Mm. You know, doing one thing well is hard, but right. then trying to do many many things well all simultaneously, then you know, you're opening yourself up to kind of 
slipping on a few banana skins, which even the mighty Goldman Sachs uh, seemingly has done. Mm. And with with Morgan Stanley, one one final point there was they had actually record wealth management revenues, yeah, which offset that decline in banking uh, fees. So there's there there comes that diversification mix, right? Protecting yeah, and I, I guess it's backing the right diversification horse. So Morgan Stanley yeah. spent much more time backing that growth in their wealth management division, whereas Goldman's have been way more aggressively going after that kind of commercial bank side. And yeah, yeah, the Morgan Stanley the commercial... a better direction. Yeah, the problem with the, I find superficially talking, I think it's like if you're going to go into the commercial side, now you start stepping into fintech and technology. Yeah. I'm not sure that's the right horse to back. Whereas wealth... I think that's a much more alignment in terms of your client side and the platform interaction software that is required. I think it's just 100%. smoother. Yeah, and it's, as you say, way more aligned to your kind of core mm. business, you know, both on the IBD side and on the trading side, right? If you've if you're got wealthy people who are your clients and that kind of feeds in, you can cross-sell you know, your other products yeah. from the core part of your business. So yeah, it's way, way, way closer to that core. Okay, well, look, let, let's talk about one other pocket of the the financials space, which was asset managers. And the reason why is because the world's largest one, BlackRock, also reported. Um, they're, just to give you an idea, a sense of numbers, $146 billion of quarterly long-term net inflows, record full-year net sales of Aladdin, which might need a bit of an explanation, Aladdin's platform, it's the kind of the industry benchmark platform. A um, couple of things, though. They had an 8% decrease in their full-year revenues, primarily driven by the impact of significantly lower markets and dollar appreciation on average assets under management and lower performance fees. Um, but their revenues, the EPS, both beat expectations against where the street was was looking. So yeah, how how do what's an asset manager's play here? Where do they fit in, and, and where are they deriving their performance from? And are, are they just more stable then than what you've described from some of these other banks? Well, so yeah, it's an entirely different setup, of course. So an asset manager will um, manage assets, as the name <laughs> suggests. Um, so this is where uh, people um, with surplus income, wealthy people who want to invest that money um, can choose to uh, give it to an expert investor um, and will so therefore will hand over their cash to a BlackRock of this world. Um, and BlackRock will then manage it. And it depends on, look, BlackRock have got so many uh, investment products that they're selling to wealthy people, right? And you know, the, the big winner for BlackRock over the last few years has been their ETFs. Um, so this is doesn't require any management. This is not actively managed money. This is passive, right? So this is where an individual can buy, you know, a FANG ETF where they can then get themselves invested in the the growth in share price of the tech stocks, for example. So there's lots of ETF products that has attracted in a huge amount of inflow right so when blackrock when they report their quarterly so they reported a quarterly long term net inflow of 146 billion dollars right in quarter 4 what does that mean did they make 146 billion dollars what is that revenue or profit well it's neither of those all it is is on nets, that was the amount of money coming in, as in clients depositing. It, you could call it a deposit, but it's not a deposit like you would think about JP Morgan, right? Um, this is a deposit where they're buying one of the investment products that BlackRock are running, okay? So the way that BlackRock generate revenue is twofold. It's through um, a management fee, and that will be a percentage of the assets they have under management. So this is the bit of their revenue stream that's super stable, and it's not volatile, and it's annually reoccurring, 
And these are very, this is very attractive from a revenue point of view, right? Stable, annually reoccurring. That fee is just a percentage of assets under management. What percentage depends on the product, right? So if you've got an ETF where it doesn't require much management at all, well, then the percentage um, fee they charge is much smaller. And it might be somewhere between 0 0.1% up to maybe 0.5%, right? But there are other products that BlackRock and these other asset management firms run, which are actively managed funds, which requires a portfolio manager and expertise, and they're trying to deliver a return over and above the index, right? And there they'll charge a management fee that will be higher, maybe up to 2%, okay? So how much assets they have under management directly um, essentially computes their revenue they get for that year through these management fees. So if, they, if BlackRock have got 10 billion, uh, sorry, 10 trillion under management, then, then, then fine, they're going to be generating huge revenues, okay? The other side of their revenue is then from performance where they'll take a percentage of the profit so certainly in the actively managed funds um, they'll take a percentage of profit and obviously there that's much more volatile but in 2022 you got a double whammy negative double whammy for asset managers because the value of the assets under management dropped not necessarily because clients were pulling their money out it's just the value of asset share prices went down. And so the value of assets dropped, which means their fees dropped. And of course, performance, well, stock markets dropped, so the performance fees were much lower as well. Um, but to give you an idea, BlackRock's quarter four revenue was $4.3 billion revenue. They're the biggest asset management, asset manager in town, 4.3 3 billion. Do you want to know JP Morgan's revenue? Quarter four? Go on. 35.6 billion. Mm. So almost, well, what's the mass there? Not, not 10 times, but not far off. But obviously, much, 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 much bigger as a kind of entity from a revenue point of view. Uh, but JP Morgan are a big giant consumer bank and they're a big giant investment bank. If you looked at Goldman's, who are more of an investment bank, right? Well, Goldman's revenue was 10.6 billion. So Goldman's a double, more than double BlackRock in terms of revenue. Mm. Um, but BlackRock's revenue is more stable. It's less cyclical. So you could say it's a bit more, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's more, you could say it's more valuable from a valuation point of view because there's more stability there. Mm. Yeah, I was just trying to have a look at um, from a software perspective with Aladdin, mm. which is the electronic kind of system that's been built in house by BlackRock for uh, their risk management division and for their users to manage their portfolios. So I was just trying yeah. to see what how that factors in. Whether do you get that as a freebie just through like when you are that's using their services or? I believe so. It's actually a good question. I don't know definitively. I'm not a BlackRock customer, but mm. um, so I don't know what products you need to be buying in order to qualify for that kind of system. So uh, I'm actually not sure. Mm. I was just looking at it. It has roughly 30,000 investment portfolios are managed through that particular platform. Yeah. So I think that's for their more sort of premium side of their offering, which mm. will be for people who have a little bit of expertise and perhaps want to run their own, manage mm. their own portfolio, but they're kind of using BlackRock to execute trades through, but also then, you know, using their kind of clever tech in order to better manage that, that so money. To conclude this, this segment then, so BlackRock would sit on the buy side and everyone else who discussed is more sell side. So from a young person thinking about my career from a top level, what would my working, what's the difference between working at a BlackRock or working at a Goldman's from a day-to-day -day lifestyle point of view, work-life point of view? Like yeah. How do they differ 
and it doesn't have to be Goldman's, but like investment banking to asset management? So I would say that asset management's much more markets. It's more geared around markets because you're investing, you're taking risk, you're on the buy side. So that would mean that your day is going to be geared around market opening. When's the market open? So you'll, you'll tend to get into work a lot earlier. You need to be in before the open, right? And it depends what markets you're kind of investing in, but you're going to typically get in early. You might get in at, I mean, I used to, I mean, I used to trade, um, I actually used to trade German markets that, that, that those markets would open at 7 a.m. London time. So I, I would need to be in the office before 7 a.m., before the open. And then, right, we're off and running at seven. And then those markets used to kind of close, well, back in the day anyway, used to close at 4 p.m. So I'd be in before seven. And then after four, right, I'm then, you know, tidying up, sorting things out, but I'm, I'm probably out of the door by 4.30, right? So you start earlier and you finish earlier, but it's way more intense during those hours because the markets are up and down, a lot of volatility, you're managing risk, and it's you're right at the coal face of market volatility and you're taking risk, right? So your P&L's swinging, so it's really intense. Um, I think if you work in IBD at Goldman's, the differences are from the timing point of view, you're in much later. You're not, you know, you're not dictated by financial market hours. You're working on deals, right? And so you might be in later. You might start work at nine, even 9.30, but you're typically going to stay a lot later. So you might work till 9.30 p.m. So you might do a 12-hour day. Also, you're going to, when deals are happening, you're going to be working weekends. I mean, that's the beauty of being a trader or being on the buy side. When markets are shut, well, markets are shut. So the weekend markets aren't open, right? But when you're doing a deal and, you know, timelines are tight, then, yeah, you're going to have to work through, you know, through the night. You're going to have to work weekends when, you're, when the deadlines are approaching. And so I think the hours are longer in banking. But there, a lot of the time, it's much less intense. Unless you're unless you're right up against a, a deal deadline, and don't get me wrong, you're going to be under a lot of pressure, and it's going to be really intense. But most of the time, you're not right up against a hard deal deadline. So it's a, just a little bit more. It's less intense. You know, your your each hour of the day is going to be less intense. From a remuneration point of view, similar or. Is is uh, asset so, management more consistently stable, and then investment banking a byproduct of the environment? Yeah, so I'd say yes. That that on the one hand that's true. So banking is more volatile, um, but as we've just discussed, <laughs> it's difficult for banks to properly pay you a lot less when mm. we're in a downturn because they're worried about losing the talent, right? But even with that said, yeah, yeah your your re- your income as, as a, an employee will be more volatile. But on the buy side, um, yeah, on an asset manage certainly an asset management firm, yeah, you'll have a more stable income. But then it depends if you're a trader, uh, if you're a trader at a hedge fund, mm. then actually a large portion, of, a much larger portion of your income is. Uh, based on your performance. So it's a portion of the profits you make. So if you met, if you have a great year and make huge profits, great, you're going to earn a lot of money. But if you have a bad year and you lose money, then your, your, your income is going to drop sharply. So if you're at a hedge fund, I'd say that's probably where your earnings are most volatile. You then travel through the buy side. So you go into the asset management space and it becomes much more stable. Mm. then you go across into investment banks and on the investment bank market side, it's probably a bit more stable, but then you go to the IBD side and it becomes more volatile. Mm. I would say. High high risk, high return then. (laughs) Yeah. Such is life. That's right. All right. Well, look, let's, um, let's just spend 10 minutes if we can, just to have a quick chat through something else, I think to put on people's radar. Uh, You mentioned before about, 
the fact that if you've opened a bank account the last 12 or 13 years and you probably haven't been used to earning some interest on your money at the bank well the debt ceiling the debt ceiling for you and i i know brings back memories uh, 2011 and i know you're going to explain what happened in 2011 but i remember because i was in hong kong on holiday at the end of the year and i was being called <laughs> multiple times <laughs> saying where the expletive are you <laughs> like <laughs> you need to do your job basically and I was like really like other people can't just do this for like a day or two and uh, I literally had to spend an entire day of my holiday covering and this was literally on New Year's Eve I think when it rolled over and it was like right this is we're going off the cliff it was what yeah. the fear was at the time <laughs> and uh yeah brings back horrific memories of absolutely ruining my holiday at the time. But yeah, the debt ceiling, <laughs> why are we talking about it? The US yeah. Treasury uh, is now taking extraordinary measures to meet its debt obligations. It has transpired this week. And that's after the US government hit its $31.4 trillion borrowing limit. So to kick things off, what is this debt ceiling and why does it ma matter? Yeah, the US then just uh, the, the debt ceiling concept has been around for over 100 years, actually. A bit of history for you. Um, the US government set in place the debt ceiling the first time was in 1917. Prior to that, basically, this is about borrowing and spending. All right, it's about controlling the government's budget. How much are we going to spend on stuff? And right, do we need to actually therefore borrow some money if we, if we want to spend more than we're earning? Obviously, governments earn through tax. Um, if we do want to spend more than we're earning, right, we might need to borrow some money. Pre-1917, there were no controls on it. It was just the government made a decision on a case-by-case -case basis, right, should we spend money on that? Should we spend money on this? You know, just case by case. Then the First World War kicked off and spending ramped, obviously, on defence, and so they thought, oh, yeah, actually, we perhaps should set in place some rules around how much the government is allowed to spend and therefore borrow. Otherwise, this could get out of control. So they set in place this thing called the debt ceiling, which is basically an agreement um, by Congress. And that's the U.S. government. And there's two parts to Congress. There's the House of Representatives and there's the Senate. And Congress has to each year essentially agree a maximum amount that their debt level can get to just so that it's kind of kept in check and doesn't get out of control. So that's the kind of background to it. But add in the entirely bipolar and maybe you might call dysfunctional US polit political situation, then you have a big problem. And again, to simplify massively, you've got the Democrats and the Republicans, okay? And they've got very different ethoses about how you run a country. Uh, the Democrats are typically, they like um, larger government that has much more spending. So the government's in much more control over the economic system. They're typically spending a lot more and therefore they need to borrow in order to spend and they'll tax more. OK, that's like the Democrat side, big government, more in control. Republicans are the opposite. They're like small government. It's like, let's not interfere too much. Let's just let this system play out, market forces and all the rest of it. So that the Republicans typically, therefore, like to spend less and they like to tax less. OK, so when you've got this bipolar situation where you've got the Democrats and the Republicans, and they're both equally as powerful. And at the moment, you've got the scenario where the House of Representatives is controlled. There's a majority of Republicans in the House, and there's a majority, majority of Democrats in the Senate. Both parts of Congress have to vote through an increase in the debt ceiling, both sides, which basically means the Republicans and the Democrats all have to agree on an increase in the ceiling. But of course, 
for those Republicans, it's often very much going entirely against their entire political ethos to increase the debt ceiling. Um, but that's kind of where we stand. Obviously, Biden's in the White House. That's the kind of third leg of the stool of the US government kind of makeup. And obviously, Biden's a Democrat, right? So um, this is where we stand. So each year, the government has to, if they want to agree on a budget, which underpins the government's entire spending for an entire year, spending on literally everything, in order to agree a budget, they essentially have to agree to increase the debt ceiling in order to achieve that budget. And periodically, if the political situation is bipolar enough and dysfunctional enough, then they don't agree and they can't agree. And the Republicans are like, no, I'm not agreeing for you, the Democrats, to spend more money and increase our debt. Or I'm only going to agree to that if there's concessions and you agree to X, Y, Z of things that we want, okay? And it becomes this political tool, this political gamesmanship. But the problem is the, the stakes uh, couldn't be higher because worst case scenario, if they can't agree and legally, therefore, the debt ceiling can't increase, well, then literally the US government runs out of cash. And therefore, they can't do things like, well, never mind pay their staff or pay the military or pay their pensioners or stuff like that. They, they also cannot pay the interest on their debt. So that's bond coupon payments, which could mean that the US default. And if you have the biggest government on the planet with the most amount of debt defaulting, well, then that's your Armageddon right. scenario. So if I'm a politician then, like Donald Trump, and I want to fund my wall, like <laughs> back in 2018, yeah. then all what I would say is like, right, I'll sit here and have the longest government shutdown in US government history. I think it's 35 days. And look, you'll blink. Yeah. And it's that went on and on and on. You remember? <laughs> it's a game of chicken. And so yeah, you're right. So this is the what the, the government shutdown that you've just mentioned. Mm. That's when literally, well, they hit the debt ceiling. And so, right, we need to now obviously avoid default. So we're going to close down and we're going to basically run with a skeleton crew so that we don't go bankrupt and let's get a deal done ASAP so um, we can actually continue to actually run this country. And so, yeah, Donald Trump forced a shutdown. Yeah, was it 35 days in the end, wasn't it? Yeah. That was the longest he one. Did, he did two government shutdowns while he was president, actually. Yeah. The, the, yeah, the latter, I think, was the longest in history at the time. But yeah, I remember that that's all well and good from Trump's perspective to force the hand to get fund his wall. However, what then started to happen is the longer the government is shut down, the bigger the economic consequence, and it starts to compound right. then over time, as does then um, how people view your government. And so yeah. it becomes then a self-defeating exercise. And then there comes in, well, then I'm not going to bargain with you. And then it goes on and on. And hence, the cliff edge does become a tangible reality. So 2011, what happened there? And, and how do rating agencies fit into this conversation? Yeah, well, this is very, the first thing to say is this is very normal, right? It's almost every year. And actually, here's the stat. The gov US government has agreed to raise the debt ceiling um, 78 times since 1960. So 1960, well, hang on, what's that? That's 63 years. In 63 years, They've agreed to raise the ceiling 78 times, 49 times under Republican presidents, 29 times under Democrat presidents. OK, so it's all the time this where, OK, we've got to negotiate. We've got to raise the ceiling. We've got to raise the ceiling. U.S. debt's going up and up and up every now and then. It's different where the stakes are higher, the political gamesmanship is much greater 
you know, the bipolar dysfunctional nature of Congress is at an extreme. And this is where you hit one of those moments where they, they're playing chicken with each other and it kind of gets out of control and they go into a government shutdown and they're facing, you know, essentially default. And so what happened in 2011 is it went, and they were talking about this kind of, yeah, the cliff, the fiscal cliff, um, which is where, look, if you guys, if you don't actually, Congress, if you can't agree, we literally will get Armageddon, right? Armageddon scenario is getting closer and closer and closer. And so what happened was that default risk started to increase. I mean, the default risk on US debt is as close to zero as you can get. It's supposed to be the risk-free asset. So if your default risk is super low, you normally have a credit rating that's really high, AAA rated, right? That means virtually no risk of default at all. But in 2011, the S&P, the Standard & Poor's Rating Agency, this risk got the default, the fiscal cliff risk, the Congress risk, if you want, got so high that the Standard & Poor's said, actually, you know what? The risk of defaults now tangibly gone away from zero to the point where we're going to have to now downgrade your credit rating. And for the first time ever in history, in the summer of 2011, Standard & Poor's cut the US credit rating only by one notch from AAA to AA, but it was very symbolic. And markets, global markets, went into kind of a, a panic mode because it was like, wow, okay, normally this stuff just in the end gets dealt with. But if the Standard & Poor's have gone and said, look, this is different, when default risk is now getting meaningful and they've cut rating. And so suddenly markets started to price in this uh, Armageddon scenario, actually maybe maybe the unthinkable may be actually happening. Yeah. I suppose then to, to conclude, with all of this debt ceiling talk re-emerging, as it has done now, if there was a genuine threat as far as perceived from investors, this market should theoretically be going through the floor, but it's not. I mean, that's not to say we haven't declined over the last 24 hours or really since that weaker retail sales report, I think we had midweek, but that came on the context of a pretty stellar start. I think it was the best performance we've had at the beginning of the year in the last yeah. month or so in, in US equities. So um yeah, I think, yeah, you, you look at the dollar, you look at yields right now, the market's not freaking out, right? No, but it's one to, it could well be that this 2023 mm. is another one of the, actually, this one's different and it's going to be more impactful than normal. And that's just because, I don't know if you were following the um, the House Speaker uh, election house of republicans this guy kevin mccarthy in the end got nominated as the house speaker but it was a massive political battle to kind of engineer him into the position okay the concession he had to make in order to get the job and the house speaker is in charge of the, the house basically right um in order to get the job the he had to agree to allow three members of the what's called the House Freedom Caucus. And this is the part of the Republican Party that's like super right wing, extreme right. So everything I was saying there about conservatives don't like to spend and borrow and tax. They like small government, no spending, no borrowing, no tax, right? Well, these the, the, the House of Freedom Caucus of death, the idea of spending more, it's like, like the devil worship, okay? So, but three members of that caucus have been put onto what's called the Rules Committee. McCarthy had to put them on the Rules Committee to get over, to get their votes and get him over the line to become the House Speaker. This is going to come back to bite these lot in the ass because nothing can be debated on the, on the House floor that hasn't been signed off by the Rules Committee. So will the House of Representatives vote through an increase to the debt ceiling? Well, the answer is it's going to be way harder this year than it has been for a long time. 
because of the political situation. So I, I would predict, and I'm definitely not alone in this, that this year the debt ceiling issue is going to be more impactful than it has been for quite a while. Um, now, I'm not saying the, the US are going to default. Of course, in the end... yeah. <clears throat> The, so the more realistic scenario then is that Biden will have to concede. And so that's going to be politically harming in the short term for him. Yeah. In a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny. It's like, what's, what's the point of a president? <laughs> if I, yeah. So it's definitely um, one to what it's a, it's a, a meaningful risk on the, on the horizon and something mm. to monitor. This is all going to play out over the next few months, right? And we're like, when we move into the summer, we get the closer we get to the summer, the bigger an issue it's going to get. So for now, just be aware of it. It's not impacting markets today, but it's one to monitor. Cool. Well, look, let's wrap it up there. And thank you very much. If you've made it to the end of the episode for sticking with us, and if you have done and you haven't already dropped us a rating and a review on Spotify, Apple, wherever you listen, please do. It helps then just push out the podcast to as many people. And if you can pass it on, if you enjoy the, the episodes to just one other person. And if everyone did that, who subscribes <laughs> and listens, it would make a huge difference. So yeah, please do. Uh, it would mean a lot to us. So yeah, hopefully you enjoyed that episode and we'll see you again next week. Thank you very much, Piers. Have a good weekend.